Hi, Richard Foreman here with the fifth episode of the Dodgy Reg podcast, in which Reg lets a little romance into his life and serves up some fresh coffee in his flat. Not, as this story is titled, Fake Coffee. I bump into Reg on the street one day. He is looking unusually spruce. He's trimmed his beard neatly and is in possession of a rather smart new coat. When I compliment him on it, he tells me with some pride that he'd found it in one of the more upmarket charity shops. So what's new with you these days, Reginald? What's the latest on America's president? I think you'll find that the man in question was covertly assassinated in the late 1990s. What we are contending with now is an animatronic replicant. The tweets are almost certainly computer-generated. If you read enough of them in succession, you can see how the algorithm is structured. The real question is, he pauses dramatically, who has their fingers on the control panel? Hmm... I already regret inviting him to enlarge on that one. That does tend to be the question, doesn't it? But you, you're looking good. A haircut too, if I'm not mistaken. Any reason for all this? Richard, his voice assumes a tone of significance. I've been a bachelor for too long. It's time for me to obtain a partner. Someone with whom to share my life. I am for several moments unable to respond. The idea of Dodgy Reg in a relationship is inconceivable to me. No human being could possibly maintain any degree of sanity whilst coping with a man's endlessly peculiar notions, his frequent tilts into paranoia, let alone the perpetual whiff of old Holborn and unwashed armpits. OK, he appears to be making some effort with his appearance, maybe even the personal hygiene. But short of a complete personality overhaul, it does not stack. Seriously? I finally splutter. Reg looks offended. Of course, he says with an almost icy calmness. It is not a decision to be made lightly. Don't worry, Richard. I have taken a number of the necessary steps. Over the next few days, I come to the probable conclusion that nothing can possibly come of this. The notion will pass. Reg will prove completely unable to maintain the standards that this enterprise requires and will once again embrace the solitude to which fate has largely assigned him. Yet there is some romantic streak within me that, against all the odds, wants it to happen. I then find that I am the recipient of a text message inviting me to visit Reg in his flat for a coffee. The unprecedented nature of this invitation unsettles my sense of certain doom and prods hope into extended life. I stand at the top of the metal fire escape, about to thump Reg's front door heavily when I notice that a small, heart-shaped metal knocker has been affixed to it. I rap. The door opens. I'm greeted by a rotund woman, wearing a long black rayon skirt and a deep purple fringed top. Her hair is also purple, with pink streaks, and stands around her head as if she's just received a stark electric shock. She wears a number of brightly beaded necklaces and just below them hangs a pendant, an ankh, I think. Her face is dense with makeup, but her green painted lips crease in a warm and welcoming smile. Richard, I nod. Come on in. Richard's in the kitchen making coffee. I'm Cass. We briefly shake hands. Her grip is firm and cool. I follow her in. Can it be that Reg has found someone? Already? I'm not sure what to say. Nice to meet you, I finally venture. Are you staying here? 
She picks up the incredulity in my voice and laughs. Yeah, I know. Not a lot of room in this place, is there? Beyond the little lobby, I notice immediately a strong smell of incense. This is supplanted only in the kitchen by the odour of fresh coffee. Reg is busy with some sort of espresso device. It looks complicated and emits quite a lot of steam. He briefly acknowledges my arrival with a smile. Wait till you taste this, Rich. Most coffee is fake. This is the real thing. I notice there is a vase of carnations on the little breakfast table and beside it a large purple candle on a brass holder. We are in the living room. Somehow a space has been created amongst the cardboard and plastic boxes of Reg's possessions into which a small two-seater sofa and an unravelling wicker chair have been inserted. Reg and Cass are jammed onto the sofa. I'm perched on the chair and we are drinking small cups of acridly strong black coffee. Reg has put together one roll-up for Cass and is now constructing one for himself. I notice he is more generous with the tobacco in hers than in his own. A joystick is already smouldering in a holder on the mantelpiece. I have learned by now that Cass is short for Cassiopeia, that she plays the guitar and writes her own songs. She'd sung two of them at a local pub's open mic night and had been warmly congratulated on their quality by Reg after she stepped down from the stage. One of them was called Who Killed the Kennedys? The other was about the importance of attaching crystals to one's mobile phone. They'd got talking and hit it off. I was no longer quite so surprised. See, when when Reg told me about his charcoal tablets, I thought, oh, yes, absorbs the poisons, doesn't it? All the glyphosate and neonicotinoids and that. I've been so much fitter since I started on them myself. In just a couple of days, they really make a difference. You should try them. I'm doing the smiling and nodding thing double time with these two. I've already told him that, cuts in Reg. But he's a cynic, Richard is. Takes everything with a pinch of salt. He gives me an intentionally withering look. Cass shrugs her shoulders and grins at me. Well, perhaps you shouldn't believe everything you're told. Isn't that right, Reg? I, I don't know. I just think that if any idea or hypothesis or whatever, if it can't be rigorously and scientifically tested, then it's not worth wasting one's powers of belief on. Cass looks like she's thinking that one through. Reg interjects. So, where does the money come from for all this rigorous and scientific testing you think so much of? Commercial interests, that's who. They've got the entire scientific establishment sewn up. Oh, bunch of bastards, aren't they? Cass joins in enthusiastically. I mean, the bee thing, same story. They want to eliminate bees, so we're all dependent on them to sell us tiny robot gadgets for pollinating all our seeds. I can almost see the little hymn book between them, the one they're both singing from. It's touching. Yet, as I down the last of the real coffee, the bitterness at the back of my throat counterpoints any such sweetness of sentiment. The intention was there on my part to keep in closer touch. After all, it was a pretty amazing development and I wanted to see how it panned out. But the way my work goes, I get immersed in something, lose all track of time and the social side of life goes down the tubes. So it's getting on for a month or so before I see Reg again. He calls round at my place just as he used to before, without prior announcement. He's on his own. 
Some of the dapper look has dissipated, but he still has that tidy coat he'd bought, and there's a spring in his step. So my first impression is that all's well. I'm at a pause point, so I welcome him in, and with an apology that it's not up to the same standard as his perco stuff, put the kettle on for a coffee. So, how's things? How's Cass? He's already pulling a paper out of the packet and giving it a fold prior to the insertion of tobacco. Oh, yes, Cass. Tampered with, I'm afraid. I stop in my tracks aghast. Sorry? What do you mean? He pulls out the packet and measures out a weedy quantity of tobacco, his eyes on the emergent cigarette not meeting mine. Some sort of brain implant, I'd say. They can become quite unstable after a while, those kinds of implants. People get strange ideas. I've seen it happen a good few times now, Rich. One minute, they seem like sensible, reasonable people. The next, there's a little electrical buzz in their brain and they're off on one. That was Cass, I'm afraid. She she just stopped making any sense. No point in carrying on with a thing like that. Of course, I've had my doubts, and plenty of them. But all the same, there's a feeling in my chest, like a house of cards has just collapsed. Rich, that's really bad news. You two seem like you were, you know, on the same wavelength. Well, he looks up at me at last and grins. The transmission was interrupted. These things happen, you know. Happen all the time. I'm not sure what to say. He lights up. Don't worry about it. I'm fine. Matter of fact, it's given me a chance to appreciate my bachelor lifestyle. It's not so bad. In fact, I rather enjoy it. Now, didn't I hear that kettle boiling? Let's have some of your fake coffee, shall we? Next time on the Dodgy Reg podcast, we go back in time to the day when Richard first encountered Dodgy Reg and we learn of some of the secrets hidden in seemingly innocent street furniture. (laughs) 